we were we were told last week um, first we were told there was one 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 sort of one it sounded like we were told there was one incident but there was very careful wording that was used there and we later found out during the course of the meeting that there was in fact at least two veterans this has happened with uh, and um, and so uh, I wanted to ask you uh, with your knowledge of uh, of what uh, what occurred here um, we were we were told that the conversation uh, only was surrounding benefits uh, that were available to the veteran and that, uh, that, that medical assistance in dying wasn't pushed or, or proposed. You've, you've indicated to us that, in fact, it was pushed, and it was pushed numerous times, uh, despite insistence from the veteran that, it, that they weren't interested. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about what actually, uh, how that conversation played out? Uh, first, the recordings that I have are were recorded by the veteran himself, um, and he recorded them because of the first initial call where he was offered made. So these are two apology phone calls that were made by the VAC manager who called, say, um, that she was sorry and that the... Um, the VAC caseworker also, through the manager, expressed regret. Um, it was from those conversations where his primary concern with his VAC manager was, and in his, I'm uh, kind of torn because I can't give you the exact, I have to paraphrase, in order to uh, not be violating his privacy. So I'm walking a thin line here. Um, <coughs> But his primary concern was not for himself, and um, is also, I'm not going to give you the medical um, reason, like help that he was asking for, obviously. It was not PTSD, but it was something similar. But I, again, I'm torn. But either way, he was asking for help and assistance and support and resources. That I can say. Um, but his primary uh, concern was that during his original phone call with the VAC service agent, uh, somehow, in that conversation, he was told, we've done it before, and we can do it for you. And the one that we've done it for and has completed made, we are now supporting his wife and two children. This was his primary concern, to find out what in the heck are you talking about. Now, the idea that just talking about services... Um, his response to that was asking about the legality of it. First he asked, why are you asking me this? Well, I just thought you should know if up the road, but I'm in a good place right now. He expressed that uh, to me that things were sunshine and, and roses prior to this phone call. He was feeling good about life. Post phone call, he left the country because he was devastated by this phone call. It's called sanctuary trauma, where the place you go for help steps on your neck. And that's what happened here. The, um, that's, that, this is incredibly alarming, um, you know, to, to hear this account that, you know, it was pushed upon him and to the point where it, it caused him to, you know, get, be in a far worse place than he was prior to the phone call. But also the fact that we hear there was an, uh, another veteran uh, and... Uh, and uh, that uh, you know that that was followed through with in that case because we weren't we weren't obviously informed of that prior uh, as well. Can you maybe just um, elaborate on on what you do know about that? Um, was there any conversation about uh, you know other than this one other individual? Was there any conversation that you're you're aware of about others? No, and uh, in in the recording, um, there, there's that. There's my knowledge of those recordings, of which I transcribed, but also my personal conversations. I spoke with this veteran for well over two hours, perhaps more um, over a few different phone calls and numerous uh, emails. And also um, the uh, issue of, oh, these, these uh, outgoing calls, because these were outgoing calls to this veteran, outgoing, okay? But he wrote at length on my VAC account, so you got it in writing. So there is a record of all of this interaction in writing on his VAC account that I don't know what the rules are for privacy, but it is in writing on his account. 
So to say there's no records of what happened is not true. Okay. Well, that's. I really appreciate you uh, enlightening the committee because it certainly sounds as though the story were, uh, that we heard uh, last week was, was not ac actually accurate in any way. Now, I wish we had more time because it gets worse. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And now I'd like to invite uh, MP Darrell Sanson for six minutes, please. Thank you, uh, Chair. I want to thank all of the witnesses today, especially our veterans uh, who served and uh, who continue uh, to live with some of the challenges. Mr. Mankey, I, I, I can't uh, thank you enough for sharing, for your strength, <clears throat> for, for building a podcast to help more veterans around the country and maybe around the world. That's extremely positive and very important, and I thank you for that continued service in that area. Um, <clears throat> this is a very difficult uh, topic, if you want, a discussion. And it should never, ever have happened. And it's really unacceptable that it happened. Uh, and I thank all those who are sharing some particular information around that. <clears throat> it is also very important to note that it is not a service offered by Veteran Affairs to speak to uh, Med. And the minister has uh, made it very clear um, that more training immediately was needed <clears throat> and is, in effect, being uh, done as we speak, if you want. And um, we need to know maybe some, some suggestions of other things we can do to, to make it right. <clears throat> I do want to ask a question to all presenters today, and uh, maybe we can start with uh, with the, the, <clears throat> the same uh, row of presenters: Colonial Conrad, and then Corporal Mankey, and then uh, Carol, and uh, our final speaker as well. <clears throat> Back in 2021, we brought forward um, a program, 140 million dollars to ensure immediate mental health support for veterans. That meaning that you don't have to wait for your application to be processed. You can make application right off the top and you have the services right away because that's what's been shared by a number of you today, <clears throat> that we need to make sure there is no wait time when talking about mental health. Uh, so I'd like to hear from you quickly about, you know, if you if you know of people that have accessed that, and and if you have any comments to make towards that, and uh, because it is crucial, we need to do more. We need to be immediate in our services, and that's the objective of that. And even if your application is denied, you still have two years of service. So we'll start off with Mr. Conrad, Colonial Conrad, please and then Corporal uh, Mankey, and then. Uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you for the question. I mean, I've, I find that surprising, that 140 million. I mean, I didn't, uh, I didn't talk about myself during the, uh, the opening five minutes, but, uh, and I'm in my office. I work in the Provincial Public Service here in Alberta, but for four years of my life, I did not work. Uh, I lost both of my parents during COVID uh, and uh, have recently tried to come back uh, for mental health just for, for support. As I mentioned on the front end, you can have bad days and you can have good days. And it took, it took a long time to come to this meeting. So I do agree with what uh, with Mark, uh, Mr. Mankey has, uh, has said about that 1,000 pound telephone. Um, just in trying to get into services or support out here, uh, the wait line is extremely long. And the advice I've received is to use a, use a civilian practitioner. 
just because of the backlog that uh, the Edmonton um, Operational Support Clinic is undergoing. And of course, uh, if you mentioned that, that does seem like a lot of money uh, for immediate treatment. I'm already in the system, not to make this about me. I hate, hate the way that sounds, uh, but I do find that shocking uh, from my narrow perspective. And I, I, I don't look at this every day. <laughs> but from my perspective, I, I'm not seeing it. I'm, I'm seeing lots of my soldiers uh, who, are, who are waiting to get help. And I don't want to get in front of them because my, my cheese is slipping off the cracker again. So uh, that would be my thought. I better keep it brief. Okay. I don't uh, know if anybody has been able to quickly access help. Um, one of the main symptoms of PTSD that has to be respected when entering the mental health system is that we tend to have a very, very common aversion to any kind of administrative burden. So any sort of barrier to entry is, I, the word predatory comes to mind. Deny, deny, deny until they die is one of the common um, phrases within the injured veteran community, and that is the perception of VAC. And I say this as somebody who's receiving VAC benefits, but it was ten, or, um, five years of clawing and scratching and the most grueling meat grinder of a process <laughs> before I finally uh, was able to uh, receive the benefits that I now receive. I mean, it was brutal. It was one of the most grueling things I've ever endured, and I've endured some stuff. Um, Mr. McGee, it's got to be kinder. Mr. Minky, I'm sorry to I, did stop I go, did you I go there because topic? the time is up, but <laughs> That's fine. we'll have other possibilities. And uh, là, je voudrais inviter le deuxième. Now, I would like to invite to Mr. Luc Désilé. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to our witnesses. Thank you for your services. And thank you for coming to testify. Mr. Menke. Uh, should I understand that the person uh, that recorded these uh, d is not willing to uh, pass on the written transcription? That is correct. Um, yes. Okay. On respect ça. So. Okay, we'll have to respect that. And. Uh, the uh, deputy ministers, the two that we heard, said that there was no recording. So uh, do you think that they're actually aware of the fact that there was a recording of that conversation? I don't know. I, I couldn't comment. Um, but they are aware that there are lengthy letters f f um, saying everything that's in the transcripts are on his back account. He put it all in writing. So they're all sitting there, and they're more than aware, aware of that. So when you talk about the account and the, the writings on that account, what, what are you referring to specifically? The veteran um, put everything that I have to talk about in letter format. Through, uh, my VAC account is an uh, encrypted system. So all these emails are encrypted end-to-end, -end. And uh, he put it all in email format through my VAC account. Everything that I have here and everything uh, and more uh, and all of his concerns uh, were, are in writing. And yet, uh, it, yeah, so th that, that all exists. And, uh, of course, VAC would know that. Et ça, pas accessible. And that is not accessible? VAC. It's 100% accessible. Uh, anybody with VAC access, matter of fact, uh, any um, service officer that has access to all these files and they can read them. Anybody with the correct clearance. When you said earlier, and I'm quoting you, you said, it's, this has already been done for others. What were you referring to exactly? What he told me directly, and this is not something I heard in the recording, what he told me directly was that he was told in his original phone call where he was offered made that she said, we can do this for you because I've done it before. And one, uh, person, one veteran that we've done this before, after we completed made, after we killed him, 
We are now uh, have supports in place for his wife and his two children. That is what he told me transpired. <clears throat> okay. Okay. I'm a little bit astonished by all of this. According to you, and you have a transcription, what can you actually tell us on the content? Uh, what brought uh, the employee to speak about MAID, to offer MAID? He doesn't know either. And what he asked that exact same question uh, to the VAC manager. And she also said, I don't know. I don't know where the heck that came from. But uh, she, he was af asking for a completely separate service and, and supports for neurological injuries. And uh, she said, oh, just by the way, if up the road you have suicidal thoughts, and this is what he told me she said, it's better than blowing your brains out against the wall. That is what he told me she said. Very sensitive of her. Okay. Okay. Earlier in your testimony, you said that you were worried that your benefits uh, or that uh, uh, VAC would have you have pay uh, because of your coming here to testify. And uh, I'd like to ask you what makes you say that? Human nature. People can be vindictive. And here I am contradicting uh, I listened to the live testimony on Wednesday, and there were three points that I believe to be untrue. One, I do not believe that uh, the call was, that was not recorded. I do not believe that, and neither does the veteran that's part of the transcripts. Um, I believe that is untrue. And it was also avoided that made was pushed as opposed to, oh, by the way, this is you know, something that may be offered. It was pushed because he said the words in the transcript, why did you ask this of me? Why are you talking about this? Well, you know, just in case, up the road. She was pushing it like a bad used car salesman. It was pushed. And he asked about the legality of it. How is this legal? He asked the VAC manager. How is this legal? This can't be legal. You can't push this on people. And that is not reflective of the testimony that I heard on Wednesday. And that makes me angry. Because integrity is doing the right thing regardless of the consequences. And I know that I'm threatening two people's jobs today by saying this. I'm aware of that. And that is why I fear for my benefits. Because I'm two people, uh, I do believe, uh, we're not speaking the truth on Wednesday, and they could lose their job over it. That's why I'm nervous.